CPD event. It's the first of our events for October. And it's the first liaison event of the new season with the biomedical division. Uh, we have a very interesting lecture lined up for you this evening. Uh, medical technology in clinical practice, the science and engineering behind radiotherapy. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome our speaker, uh, Maureen Dinehy. Uh, Maureen is a lecturer at uh, Limerick Institute of Technology, where she teaches a variety of modules related to uh, biomedical engineering and medical physics on the medical technology and the clinical uh, technology degree courses. Um, she has a degree in electro electrical and electronic engineering from UCC and a master's in biomedical engineering from UL. And she has completed an internationally accredited medical physics and training program in radio radiotherapy. Uh, in the past, she has worked in the electronic and medical devices industries, as well as in clinical radiotherapy departments. Um, just uh, some housekeeping. Uh, we have some uh, upcoming events in the Thoman region um, and nationally that people watching this evening may be interested in. On October 21st, there's the Engineers Ireland Conference, which of course is in virtual format this year. Um, on October 27th, the Thoman region is running a giant event with the IET um, with Dr. Jackie Walker from UL. And the subject of the webinar is Time Travels, How We Keep Time Across the Modern World. Um, on November 11th, um, we are uh, doing a webinar with Beckman Coulter um, in County Clare on developing sustainable facilities for medical device manufacturing. Um, so for more information on, on those events, you can go to engineersireland.com forward slash events. Um, so, um, just some house rules uh, and housekeeping for tonight. The presentation will take approximately 40 minutes and Maureen will be happy to answer uh, your questions after the presentation. Um, if you can use the Q&A button uh, during the presentation to submit your questions uh, and we can moderate those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn the presentation over um, to Maureen um, to present this evening's lecture. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. So the title of my um, uh, lecture this evening is um, Medical Technology in Clinical Practice uh, and Engineering Behind Radiotherapy. And I'd like to thank um, Engineers Ireland, Home and Region for organising this um, lecture this evening. Um, uh, Mike talked to me during the summer about um, you know, any ideas I would have that you know, things might be interesting topics for Engineers Ireland. Um, and I suggested um, this topic of radiotherapy, and I also suggested that I would do it. So um, whether I invited myself or whether I was invited to do this um, presentation, I'm not entirely sure. And I won't um, make Mike answer that question uh, until afterwards. Um, but I'm very happy to be here, and um, I hope you find it um, an interesting presentation. So I'm going to start really by um, answering the question, you know, what is radiotherapy? And radiotherapy is the treat of um, malignant and benign disease. So radiotherapy treats cancer, but there's also a small subset of um, non-cancerous illnesses that are treated by radiotherapy. Uh, but mainly radiotherapy is used to treat um, cancer. And when we're talking about, um, let's give me a pointer going here. When we're talking about radiotherapy, we are um, we're looking at the higher end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're talking about gamma um, radiation. And in terms of diagnostic imaging, you're talking about um, X-rays, but it's higher energy than that. And um, that's used to treat, um, uh, that's used to treat, where the, the slightly lower X-ray energies are used in diagnostic imaging. And um, I suppose as an engineer and um, that turned a uh, medical phys physicist, um, I would say that um, Radiology can be considered um, non-destructive testing of humans, um, essentially. Um, and then radiotherapy uses ionizing radiation um, then to, um, uh, to treat cancer. So how does radiotherapy work? 
Well, in order to understand how radiotherapy works, we need to understand um, how cancer is and how cancer um, develops. So in terms of uh, normal cell, cell division, um, you have uh, normal cells that grow and multiply and at some stage um, the cell gets the signal that it needs to it needs to die and that's called cell suicide or apoptosis and what happens in normal growth in our bodies all the time is that cells are dividing and then it's time for that cell um, that cell to, cell to die but what happens in cancer is that the cell division um, keeps on going it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and that signal that apoptosis signal isn't there and that is how a tumor, um, a tumor develops. So in terms of how radiotherapy works, is that it stops, it stops that cells, it kills those cells and it stops those cells from multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and continuing to grow. And how ionizing radiation does that, um, there are two ways. There is a direct route um, where the radiation causes direct DNA damage. And then there's an indirect route where radiation um, uh, interacts with a wa water molecule in the body and that makes a free radical and that free radical um, causes DNA damage. So that is essentially um, how radiotherapy works in order to stop that uncontrolled cell um, division. Sorry, something has happened here now with my presentation. Okay, so the next question then is why does radiotherapy work? Well, in order to consider that, we need to look at um, uh, uh, this graph here. Um, on the x-axis, we have the cumulative dose. So this is a radiation dose. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of occurrence. And the reason, the why of why radiotherapy works is that tumor cells, cancerous tumor cells, are more susceptible to ionizing radiation than healthy tissue. And we can see that by having these two um, uh, uh, parallel um, uh, uh, curves on our plot. And essentially what happens is that the tumor control probability um, is reflected on this blue curve. And that tumor control probability is the probability that um, uh, the tumor will be controlled by a specific dose of radiation. Whereas the red curve is the normal tissue complication probability, and that is the probability of an adverse complication to normal tissue happening at a, a specific dose. So if it, within the therapeutic range of doses, um, we can see here that you can have a high tumor control probability and a low a normal tissue complication probability. And the ratio between there is what gives us the therapeutic index. And that is essentially the range of doses that allow us to have control over the tumor while minimizing the normal tissue complication probability. So types of radiotherapy, you can categorize it in terms of delivery mode, where you have external beam radiotherapy, and that is what I'm going to be concentrating on today. External beam radiotherapy is delivered by linear acceleration. And the other type of, of uh, delivery mode of radiotherapy is brachytherapy. And that is radiotherapy that uses um, a, radioactive ion, uh, a radioactive isotope. And that isotope is introduced into the body in order to, um, uh, in order to treat. Um, so external beam radiotherapy using a linear accelerator, um, it, it, it's, the machine itself isn't radioactive, but when it is turned on, it produces photons um, uh, uh, that um, uh, um, are, are delivered in a um, controlled way to the patient. So you can also categorize radiotherapy by the intent of the treatment. And you have um, radical treatment where radiotherapy is a primary modality um, uh, for cure. You have adjuvant treatment where radiotherapy is used in conjunction with surgery or chemotherapy. Um, and what is used in those instances is to reduce um, the risk of tumor recurrence. So, um, you know, a, a common adjuvant treatment would be breast, uh, um, uh, breast cancer treatment, where a patient would have um, a surgery, which would be the definitive removal um, of a, a cancerous tumor from the body. And then they have um, a combination, depending on staging, of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, um, um, or one or the other. And chemotherapy and radiotherapy are to reduce the risk of tumor recurrence and to um, uh, uh, ensure that um, there is no remaining um, uh, cancerous tumor within the breast after the surgery. And then there's palliative radiotherapy, and that is used to reduce pain and to um, address acute symptoms. 
And that actually is the, um, in that case, radiotherapy actually um, it can be used in an emergency situation in things like spinal cord compression. So that is where a tumor is impinging on the spinal cord and the patient can have symptoms like, like, like paralysis. And if they receive radiotherapy um, uh, uh, early enough, that paralysis can actually be reversed. Um, and the other emergency situation where you would have radiotherapy is in um, superior vena cava obstruction, and that's where a tumor is impinging on the superior vena cava, and um, uh, radiotherapy would shrink that tumor and um, prevent um, an obstruction there. So just briefly to talk about radiotherapy in Ireland, and I have to thank um, Brendan McLean for giving me this information. I emailed him yesterday and he, he, he very quickly came back to me with this information. So um, Brendan McLean is the chief physicist in St. Luke's Radiation Oncology Network, and he's also the chief physicist involved in the NPRO, which is the National Programme for Radiation Oncology. And that is a programme within the HSE that um, um, has planned the delivery of radiotherapy services in Ireland. And the training program that I did in Galway was part of the NPRO, where they have um, a specific training program for our medical physicists in Ireland um, in order to um, uh, increase and introduce the, um, I suppose, expand the radiotherapy um, physics um, pool within Ireland. So in terms of HSC centres in Ireland, you have um, the St. Luke's um, uh, Radiation Oncology Network. Um, which has St. Louis Hospital in Rathgar. They have two centres in St. James's Hospital in Beaumont um, and in Beaumont Hospital as well. So geographically distribution uh, between North and South Dublin. Um, in Galway University Hospital, hospital um, where I trained, um, there is a centre there that has three linear accelerators. And in Cork University Hospital, there is a centre that has five um, linear accelerators. Accelerators, and that is a lovely centre. That uh, the new centre, the Glandora Centre, opened about a year ago, um, and it has you know beautiful top of the range um, equipment there. And if you haven't guessed already, I'm from Cork, so um, uh, if you haven't guessed by my accent, so um, it's, it's it's a lovely centre that is there in Cork. So then, um, uh, so uh, uh, within then, there's also uh, private centres in Ireland uh, that deliver radiotherapy, and where I worked for eight years was the Matter Private. Um, uh, center in Limerick. So that is a radi radiotherapy center where um, there's two, lin two linear accelerators, two Linux, and um, there is um, a service level agreement with the HSE to provide um, radiotherapy services to public patients and private patients who are also, are also treated there. Um, so that center is actually on the grounds of the University Hospital in Limerick, here in Limerick, where I am tonight. And um, uh, uh, there's also um, the uh, UMPC Whitfield uh, Centre in Watford, and that also has um, a service level agreement with the HSC. And then other private centres in the country are um, Beacon Hospital, Hermitage, um, Matter Private in Dublin, which is obviously a sister centre of the Matter Private um, Centre in Limerick, and St Vincent Hospitals. And there's two linear accelerators in Galway Clinic and two in the Bounce Colours in Cork. And then on top of that, there is in Northern Ireland, there are two NHS facilities, one in Antigelvin and Derry, and there is a service level agreement with the HSC um, uh, to, tr to treat patients um, there. So as you can see in the geographical spread, obviously it, it, it was a lot more convenient for uh, patients to attend the Antigelvin Centre, and, and there's also a, a very large centre in Belfast. Um, so, you know, I suppose it is widely known that ionizing radiation causes cancer. So if it causes cancer, then um, uh, how come we also um, are using it to treat cancer? Well, yes, exposure to ionizing um, radiation exposure to ionizing radiation can adversely affect health. And the reason ionizing radiation affects health, and the reason why it needs to be shielded for and accounted for, is because the um, there are two types of effects of ionizing radiation. Um, so the first is a stochastic effect. That is essentially a kind of a, a roll of the dice a random effect. And with ionizing radiation, the stochastic effect means that even for a very low dose of radiation, I'll just turn on my laser pointer here, uh, even for a very low dose of ionizing radiation, there is a non-zero probability. And um, so there is some risk that it can cause an adverse effects. 
Um, so in terms of stochastic effect, it is um, uh, uh, development of a mutation which can result in cancer or other hereditary effects. So that stochastic effects means that even for very, very low doses of radiation, um, uh, there is a non-zero chance that um, uh, uh, it can cause cancer or cause a hereditary effect. And the other effect in, um, turn off the pointer again, the other effect is deterministic. So a deterministic effect means that there has to be a threshold, that the dose has to go above a particular value before there is um, an effect, before there is um, uh, an effect caused by it. And obviously, as the dose increases, you would have an increase in um, uh, severity. So that is why ionizing radiation is dangerous. Ionizing radiation does cause cancer, and it's because there are stochastic effects as well as deterministic effects um, that it needs to be shielded for and accounted for correctly. So in ter in, because of that, there has to be regulations and laws um, around ionizing radiation. And in Ireland, there was a new law, a new statutory instrument introduced um, uh, in 2019, and that was for the uh, protection of workers and members of the public from harmful effects of ionizing radiation. And that would have been, um, so there were other statutory in instruments prior, prior to that, uh, but this is the newest legislation around um, ionizing radiation. And um, this would have come from, um, uh, you know, harmonising European regulations um, on that as well. And in fact, the, um, the role and the regulation of medical physicists as a profession um, for the first time um, uh, came into effect um, included in this law. And the Irish College of Physicists in Medicine, of which I'm a member, um, are the, um, uh, uh, the body um, that recognise um, medical physicists. And um, you have to have a certain amount of um, cl clinical experience as well as education to join it. And then there's yearly submission of CPD in order to um, maintain the um, lofty title of medical physics expert. Um, so there's two agencies then that are in charge of um, uh, looking after and ensuring that ionizing radiation is used correctly in Ireland. And what's very interesting here is the fact that the, it's the EPA that are responsible for public and staff protection, but it's HICWA, and previously it was MARU um, in the HSE, but now it's HICWA that are responsible for patient protection. So it's very significant here and um, that uh, protection of the general public and staff, even if the staff are hospital staff or any staff in any industry that deals with ionizing radiation. Um, that is regulated by the EPA, whereas patient, uh, patient safety is regulated by HICRA. And in terms of patient safety, a principle that is used in um, uh, anything involving um, ionizing radiation, whether it's radiotherapy or diagnostic imaging, is the concept of ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. And what you want to have here is that the, the radiation dose that a patient receives is as low as reasonably achievable. And that's um, where there is the risk benefit um, uh, that's always taken um, uh, with any uh, medical intervention. Um, but there is specific um, uh, justification for radiation ex ex radiation exposures and um, there also needs to be optimization of the radiation protection and the application of, of individual dose limits and those dose limits um, um, are are set up um, as internationally recognized dose limits and the three principles really in terms of radi uh, radiation protection and that's distance shielding and time and by distance it follows the inverse square law um, 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 and shielding is what can physically be put in place to reduce um, uh, the effects of ionizing radiation and time is then the limited amount of exposure. And HICRA, they um, uh, assumed this, res this patient responsibility last year and um, so, so they recently released the first report um, on this and they put together a really, really nice infographic as a summary um, uh, looking at accidental or unintended medical um, exposures to ionizing radiation and, th and that, that is what happens. Um, and there is a very good culture um, in Ireland of reporting um, unintended um, uh, ionizing radiation um, uh, exposures. And I suppose as um, engineers within engineers in Ireland, we always um, love learning, uh, I suppose learning from mistakes and you know, after action reviews and taking um, in information and changing things. And 
reports like this and documents like this are really um, important in order to um, ensure a high quality of um, you know, patient safety in terms of ionizing radiation. So in the uh, introduction about the topic, um, I did say that um, I'd be talking ab uh, about um, how civil engineers, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers are involved in um, radiotherapy. And I suppose we have to start with the building and uh, uh, that's uh, where primarily um, civil engineers would be involved. And because in radiotherapy you're dealing with very high doses of high energy ionizing radiation, and because of um, uh, the EPA's role in protecting staff and the public and HICWA's role in protecting patients, the design of a radiotherapy centre is really important. And the RPA is the Radiation Protection Advisor who would be involved at the design stage um, in order to give specific instructions um, uh, to how a radiotherapy centre should be designed. And I got the sample designed from the IAEA, which is the International Association, the, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, and um, uh, this is just a sample design of what a bunker looks like. And so what you have here is when you're doing um, calculations for radiation protection, you need to account for the energy that's going to be used in the machines. You need to account for the, um, uh, the, 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 the use time, how, how, how the, the time that's going to be run. You need to uh, uh, take into, into account um, occupancy factor of adjacent areas. So for example, what's F here is the control room for the bunker. So you would have staff in there at all times. And in terms of the outside, um, you know, that generally could be open to the general public. So you need to take account of that um, in, the, in, the shielding, um, in the shielding requirements. So what you end up essentially is a bunker with a maze. And um, the reason you have a maze is that if you have, for any scientists that are out there, um, if you are using energy above um, 10 NV, you would have generation of neutrons, you'd have this neutron contamination, so you need to have um, a shielding bunker so that those don't get um, released into the greater, um, uh, the outside world. And um, so you end up with walls that are really, really thick, about a metre thick, and they're generally built of co concrete. Uh, but often, you know, in a, a, a hospital um, a footprint within the, the area hospital have, um, they, they often don't have the space to have big bunkers like that. So you have things like leadite blocks that are available that um, uh, would be smaller, but they'd have lead, lead in them so that, so that for the physical size, they would have a higher amount um, of radiation protection. And bunkers like this are often, um, well, they would always be on the ground floor to, to, to you know, due to the, all, all the shielding, all the concrete that's involved, but they would often be underground. And the huge advantage of that, obviously, is that you would have, um, you know, an earth backfill um, on it and you wouldn't have the, um, you know, complication of someone, um, you know, standing outside or, or, or close to the building. It would reduce that as a risk factor. So essentially what, what the bunkers end up um, looking like. A typical footprint in a radiotherapy centre. So then the history of the Linux themselves, um, it was in the 1940s that they started um, uh, being used um, a lot and um, uh, so the early, the early invention, the early um, uh, types of, of, of Linux were, were, were quite primitive but actually what I consider to have changed most is the principle of how the photon beam is generated, that hasn't actually changed significantly. What has changed is the electronics and computing technology behind it. And that has allowed the machines to um, become smaller, have greater flexibility in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, the type of um, modes available and, um, you know, adding on imaging techniques and, Kind of you know during treatment imaging and, and, and things like that. So um, um, uh, the, the the final picture here on the uh, bottom right is um, essentially a radiotherapy robot, which would have a huge amount of degrees of freedom, and um, uh, essentially you'd have you'd have effectively surgery done with um, these type of radiotherapy um, equipment. So talking about the linear, linear, linear accelerator itself, so a high energy photon beam is, um, is, is produced and the radiation dose, that beam is, is, is produced by um, electrons are um, shooted out of an electron gun, they are accelerated through a waveguide, they go through um, a bending magnet and they hit a target. And when the electrons at that really um, uh, high energy 
um, uh, high speed, they hit the target, they produce photons. And that's photon B that um, is the photon ionizing radiation that interacts in the body to um, deposit dose. And you have collimators and different, the head of the machine here in order to shape the, the dose um, and to shape the beam that will be delivered. So radiation dose is a measure of the energy deposit in the irradiated medium by ionizing radiation per unit mass. So even, even from that definition of the gray, which is the, the radiation, um, uh, which is the unit, and someone who is, gets radiotherapy is prescribed a, a dose in gray. And um, so that dose depends on the machine output being calibrated, but it also depends on the machine calibrated mechanical movements and it, it also depends on the patient geometry, tissue density, and position. So unlike, for example, if I have a headache, I'll take you know, two, two Panadol, and that is, a, that is a dose of Panadol. Um, the dose therapy is quite different because it doesn't just depend on the machine output, it also depends on the um, mechanical movements of, um, of the bed and the jaws in the my laser pointer again. Uh, the jaws here in the head of the machine, but it also depends on the, the position and geometry of the patient and, um, and the tissue density. So that's why a radiotherapy treatment plan is generated using a CT. So, uh, so a CT scan is taken of the patient and the patient's plan is um, uh, uh, created based on that. So, um, in terms of mechanical movements, um, I said that there'd be something for mechanical engineers. So, um, uh, in terms of gantry, the, the gantries move the gantries ahead of the machine. I'm just my laser pointer again, and um, that can move 360 degrees. Big McCulloch is movable, and you know, latest, develop, latest developments, you have really fancy six degrees of freedom treatment couches now. Um, you have a collimator which rotates 180 degrees and then you have what's called multi-leaf collimator and they are little leaves that interlink and um, they can shape, shape the dose of the radiation um, uh, essentially. And what a treatment plan is, it's a set of instructions to the linear accelerator. And those instructions are the um, mechanical positions as well as the dose output. So I mentioned briefly the multi-leaf collimator, and that shapes the photon beam as it, as it exits. And, you know, by having the multi-leaf collimator um, was kind of a, a you know, a seminal invention really for um, radiotherapy because it meant the beam could be shaped and that the dose could be targeted on um, uh, uh, on the tumour, on the area of interest, and organs at risk then could be shielded. And um, it's a very important part of um, a radiotherapy uh, treatment machine. So that's kind of background of the kind of treatment machine itself and, um, and the unit and, you know, how it's built and the technology that we have in order to, to, to treat radiotherapy. But what's very important, really, um, and, and, and the most important um, a person in radiotherapy is the patient themselves. And, and the patient journey from start to finish um, um, is very significant. So um, for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to be going through um, the patient journey and look at... Um, uh, look at each step. Um, some I'll go through very fast, some I'll go through slower, so if it looks like, oh, she's going to be going through all this, um, uh, um, I will pick out bits to, to, to talk more about than, than other bits. So what we need to start off with is this planning, um, is the planning CT. So the patient has already been diagnosed and um, the planning CT um, needs to occur. So the first thing with planning CT is immobilization. And what's important is that um, because a dose, a radiotherapy dose, isn't given in one go, it's given over a period of time. So a patient usually comes into a department for a dose of radiotherapy daily, um, five days a week, over anything from two to four or five, six, depending on what the dose prescribed, um, weeks. And what you need to have, because we know that the dose delivered depends on the position of the patient. So you need to have the patient in a reproducible position, that they are at the exact same position every day. And so patient mobilization is very important for the comfort of the patient, the safety of the patient, but also reproducibility of their geometry so that they receive the correct dose. And this is an example of some kind of um, uh, different types of supports. You have, um, if someone is getting head and neck treatment, they would have this 
this mask. Um, if someone, for example, is having treatment to their pelvis in terms of prostate cancer or gynecological cancers, they would often have a knee rest and ankle stock so that their hips are stabilized, that their knees and their ankles are in the same position. And those, um, those immobilization devices are indexed along the couch um, and that would, would form part of the setup instructions for the, um, for the treatment. And I have to mention here that it is the, um, the radiation therapists who um, uh, do the CT and who treat the patients. And um, uh, there is a, a degree course in Trinity College for radiotherapists and um, they um, are highly skilled in um, you know setting up patients you know correctly and then bringing them in daily and um, ensuring they have the, the 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 correct treatment every day. So it's actually the radiation therapists who treat the patients, and um, uh, the consultants um, decide the plan, and the physicists or dosimetrists um, uh, do the plan. But it's radiation therapists who treat the patients. And this is just an example. Uh, I'll get my pointer again. This is an example of um, um, a breast board for a breast setup where the arms are placed overhead to get them out of the way. And you also have a vac bag. Um, and that's essentially, it's like a bean bag with the air sucked out so that can um, keep, keep patients in the same position as well. So they are different types of immobilization devices. Um, and then you, uh, so the next step after the CT is taken is a uh, target and organ at risk delineation. And that is where the um, uh, consultant um, target so essentially on the CT they draw um, the, um, the, the, or, the, the the treatment target as well as the organs at risk and how that works is you target the gross tumor volume then a margin is allowed for the clinical target volume and that that actually is what is um, kind of sub microscopic diseases so you um, include a volume to include treatment of that then you have the planning target volume which is again another margin uh, in, increase the volume that's treated and that accounts for um, kind of daily daily setup on uncertainties um, and then you also have organs at risk so an example here of a prostate treatment where you have the prostate itself and the seminal vesicles and the red is the PTV um, and, and that is the planning target volume so that is the volume that um, uh, you, you um, are getting the dose into. And then in this instance, we can see up here part of the bladder and part of the rectum. So in those instances, they are the organs at risk. So a certain amount of those organs at risk overlap with the PTV. And this here is um, a, a, an example of esophagus. Um, and the, um, the PTV again is in red, so you'd have a, you'd have a, wide, um, a wide margin on it. And, you know, the margins, these are all from international guidelines um, on, you know, correct margins. And as imaging is getting better um, and, you know, machine precision is getting better, some margins have been decreasing um, uh, as um, it, it, basically you want to reduce the amount of normal tissue or non-included non, non tissue um, in your treatment volume. Um, so next then is treatment planning and the aim of treatment planning is to deliver between 95 and 105 percent of the prescribed dose and that comes from the ICRU um, which is the International Commission of uh, Radiological Units that is the international goal of radiotherapy and you want to keep the organs at risk within the um, established, established uh, constraints and as I mentioned already a treatment plan is a set of instructions to the lin linear accelerator where it's going to say the gantry position, the collimator position, the table position, with their MLCs, so those leaves, whether um, they're going to be involved, you can have static or dynamic MLCs, and also the monitor units, which is the length of time that the beam is on. And that is what a treatment plan is. So um, in terms of planning, when we're looking at dose, I'm going to go back and talk about isotherms first. So if we are looking at the weather and we, um, uh, we're used to seeing isotherms. So isotherms are lines that connect areas of the same temperature and that's isotherms represented in terms of a colour wash. Well in the exact same way in radiotherapy planning you look at isodose. So isodose connects areas of the same dose and represented in colour wash this is what it essentially looks like. So um, uh, the red is the area of higher dose and the blue is the, radiation, is the areas of very low dose. Um, so that is essentially what you look at in, in, in a radiotherapy plan. 
Um, and I'm just giving you a few examples of different types of plans and what they look like. So um, uh, this is a breast plan. Um, and we're, we're looking at here in, in, in three different views. And that is what radiotherapy is planned in a CT, which is a 3D imaging modality. So you can, um, uh, you can look at the um, dose distribution in three different views. And that is what's done. And every patient has their own unique treatment plan um, um, based on their own CT. And planning, um, planning algorithms and the, the, you know, the, the software that does algorithms has become um, you know, very sophisticated. And whereas before, it just kind of consider um, the body like a block of water, essentially, where everything was homogeneous. Um, but now the algorithms can um, take into account inhomogeneities um, and different tissue densities. Um, and that, that you know, is, 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 is a very significant really change in radiotherapy over the last um, you know, 20 and 30 years. Again, a whole brain treatment. So this is where it would be a more homogeneous dose distribution. But you can see here that the eyes would be very much um, um, protected. And um, uh, if you remember back to we were talking about stochastic and deterministic effects, um, a deterministic effect is actually uh, over ionizing radiation is causing cataracts. And um, that is why even though a patient may be receiving radiotherapy treatment to the whole brain, the dose to the lenses would be kept very, very low. And that can be achieved with um, you know geometry, how you how you shape the beam, how you change the head of the 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 the, um, the linac in order to get the dose out, and also those MLCs that I talked about. So you have a situation here where the um, the whole brain has been treated for this patient, but the dose to the lens will be kept really low, as low as reasonably achievable, in order to avoid um, um, cataracts in the future. And another example then uh, is looking at prostate treatment and um, you have uh, conformal versus IMRT prostate treatment. And again, IMRT is one of the advances that kind of revolutionized radiotherapy and especially in terms of um, side effects. So with a conformal plan, it was essentially like a box. The distribution looked like a box, whereas an IMRT plan, you can see it, it, it very closely hugs the PTV, that area where you want to have high dose. And the organs of risk, like the rectum of the situation, have um, a lower dose. And um, the, big, the, the buzzword, um, with IMRT is um, concavity, that it can shape the dose around um, um, a concavity. And um, you achieve better organ sparing um, by that. And then you have head and neck treatment. This is just an example where there's a simultaneous integrated boost. And what happens in this scenario is that you may have gross tumor, nodal involvement, and, and, and uh, contralateral, or on the other side, um, nodal involvement as well. And in this situation, three areas would have different, different required doses. So you, you, um, all the areas don't have the same prescription, essentially. And that can be achieved by using something called simultaneous integrated um, boost, and that allows for um, maximum sparing then of organs at risk. So where are we now? We have done our treatment plan. And um, so the next is to get that plan approved by the consultant. And um, I would always say from having planned lo lo lots of plans um, that treatment planning is solving a puzzle where there's no unique, uh, no one unique solution. And there's trade-offs and compromises along the way. But the big thing that we look at is the um, dose distribution and that will be um, discussed with the consultant, but also is this dose volume histogram, which looks at the dose to organs at risk and comparing to the, to, to the volume. So when you have a discussion with a consultant about a plan, you look at the coverage, but you also look at, um, at the organs at risk. And these tolerances come from um, international trials, like there's RTOG trials. And these would be international trials that have ensured um, the safety and efficacy of um, certain dose regimes to the organs at risk. And then in terms of safety, safety and radiotherapy, well, Swiss, it's a Swiss cheese model, essentially, where you have risk assessment and risk management, and there's different layers, so that every, every layer along the way, um, uh, um, it can be... Um, um, any error or mistake can be found. And like I said before, you have to have the EPA license in order to have um, open radiotherapy centre and EPA are responsible for the, um, uh, the public and staff, um, but it's HICWA who are responsible for the patient. And there is um, different guidelines around that. So that is this step here. I'll just get my pointer back again. 
that is this um, independent um, uh, calculation plan check and the, the, the plan approval. And these are steps really that go through to ensure that there's no mistakes or errors in the, uh, uh, in the plan. So the next step um, now is where the patient is welcomed back into the, into the department. So the patient turns up to get their CT plan and then, you know, depending on the site, two to four weeks later, they come back for their first, um, their first day of treatment. So in terms of treatment delivery, the patient is set up in the exact same position that they were CT'd in using any of the mobilization devices that um, uh, were used on the day. Um, so in order to verify that they're setting up correctly, um, essentially X-ray images are taken on the treatment um, machine. And I just have a few examples here of a pelvis site and of an esophagus site. So what we're looking at, oh, let's get my pointer back. What we're looking at here is this would be um, um, a reconstructed x-ray essentially from the CT and this would be the x-ray on the day. Excuse me, and they're matched over together and they, um, so that the, the, the patient is positioned, um, uh, positioned correctly. And you look at that in two views, you look at an anterior image and um, a lateral image, so, so from the side. So it's, uh, it's 2D matched, in some instances it can be 3D matched and um, you know that the patient is in the correct position then. And I use another example of um, an esophagus site. So if those images don't match up, the patient may need to be reseated. And um, uh, like I mentioned before, in terms of as low as reasonably achievable, um, you want to limit the amount of um, uh, x-rays and imaging that is done. So um, for a patient to be reseated, there needs to be the benefit in terms of um, there needs to be the benefit in terms of the information that is gained from there. And reasons why a patient can be reseated or replanned during treatment are if there is a, a big change in um, anatomy due to weight loss or weight gain, if there is um, big tumor shrinkage, um, seroma, which is um, uh, kind of fluid um, that you can see, or if the target mo moves outside the PCD. Um, and it, you know, the idea here is that you want to avoid change if possible and um, to identify the changes early, to quantify the difference and replan if necessary. And that's what happens through um, radiotherapy treatment. So that image review um, stage um, is repeated um, uh, uh, is repeated either every fraction or if there's no difference, then a patient mightn't be imaged every fraction, they, they mightn't be imaged until the next week. And that again is to reduce the amount of images in terms of keeping um, uh, keeping the dose due to imaging as low as reasonably achievable. And that image cycle uh, uh, continues um, until the total do dose is delivered by the patient. And once the total dose is delivered, the, treatments, the patient's treatment course is complete and um, they are finished. And they leave the department with, um, um, I suppose, a better um, prospects than when they started their journey um, at Planning CT. So one thing that I'm very proud of that I was involved in in Limerick was the introduction of um, a technique called deep inspiration breath hold. And this technique um, is where the patient is required to take a deep breath. Um, and by doing that, if you compare the images here, um, by taking a deep breath, essentially the heart is moved out of the treatment field. So this is deep inspiration breath hold where the heart is outside of the field. And this is where the, the patient is in free breathing, as it's called, and the, the, the heart is in the field. And um, um, I worked in the radiotherapy centre in um, Limerick for eight years, and this was kind of the biggest project really I worked on. And, um, you know, something I'm very proud of really that that technique is in um, uh, the Midwest here in Limerick. Um, you know, um, um, and it's a great technique to have. And it's, it's, it's recognised now around the world as a technique. Um, you know, that's, it's pretty much in all radiotherapy centres now. And it's a great technique for um, post bearing to the heart. And in terms of other advances and things that are happening in radiotherapy, one of the surface guided radiotherapy. And what's interesting about this is this is a way of um, looking at the setup of the patient without using ionizing radiation. So it's without using x ray images. And it essentially um, does a kind of a, a, a it takes a map of the surface contour um, of the patient. And if the patient moves, then um, um, uh, you know, the, the, the treating therapist can be um, alerted and they can use this, use this to set up the patient as well. And this is paving the way 
for um, tattoo less, less, less treatment. So any, if you know anyone who's had radiotherapy, you'd know that um, they have, it's, it's like, you know, a little viral pin um, mark, a tiny tattoo that's placed in order to help the reproduce, reproducibility of position. And the surface guided, guided radiotherapy is, um, means that those little tattoos um, um, are no longer necessary. You also have something called respiratory gating. And just an example here is as a patient is breathing, so let's say this is a tumor in a lung. Let's find my pointer again. This is a tumor in a lung. And as the patient breathes, the tumor can actually move outside um, the PTB. So the idea here is that um, um, the breathing pattern of the patient is monitored and that the machine is turned off when the, um, the tumor that wants to be treated is outside the PTB. Other exciting things are happening are MRI LINAC. Um, uh, again, that's looking at um, motion of organs during radiotherapy, and because MRI uses non-ionizing radiation, um, you know, it is a preferred um, modality. And then in terms of artificial in intelligence in radiotherapy, it's used at both, both diagnosis and also that um, organ delineation is really um, uh, resource intensive, I suppose, um, in that you have to, you know, delineate, um, you know, the target as well as um, the organs at risk. And in a lot of cases that can involve, you know, kind of complicated nodal chains and things like that. So it's quite time consuming. And um, so, so research is um, uh, in terms of using artificial intelligence to achieve that. And then also, as I briefly mentioned about treatment planning algorithms, those algorithms are also becoming um, more advanced as well. So um, just a summary of all that. Um, in radiotherapy, the photon radiation beam is generated by the linear accelerator. So it's not using a radioactive isotope, it's generated by the linear accelerator. And the interaction of those photons in the body is what leads to dose. And dose is different to uh, what, we, what we may consider dose in other areas of medicine, in that in radiotherapy, dose is dependent on the output of the machine, but it's also dependent on geometry and the, the tissue density essentially of the patient. And that is why a CT is used for planning purposes. Um, consistency in patient setup is important for accurate dose distribution. And that's why you have specific site and immobilization and specific setup instructions. And you also have the mechanical calibration of, of, of the machine itself. Patient positioning is confirmed using imaging. So that can be used by X-ray ortho orthogonal images and that the soft tissue um, anatomy that can be confirmed with cone beam CT. So x-rays give good view of bony anatomy, but you, you need a CT to get a better idea of the soft tissue anatomy. And then patients can be reCT'd or revenged during treatment to ensure the prescribed dose is delivered. So again, that's a trade-off between as low as reasonably be achievable in terms of setup images and also ensuring that the patient is in the correct, the correct position because if the patient isn't in the correct um, position, if the geometry isn't correct, then the correct dose um, won't be delivered. So that is essentially it. Um, what is going to be provided by Maureen after this is um, Maureen's going to send around an email with um, um, a, a survey, a kind of a questionnaire, um, uh, 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 just feedback for Engineers Ireland. But also I have asked her to distribute some um, further information. So um, um, I, I won't be providing my full slide deck, but I will be providing um, th this information. So if anyone's interested in this topic and would like to learn more, Trinity College have a really good free online course, and that's on Future Learn, which is one of those MOOC, um, uh, uh, MOOC facilities. And um, so it's, three, it's, it's like short, I think it's a two week course and it's introduction to radiation oncology from diagnosis to survivorship. And it's basically out there to give um, you know, patients and carers and you know, the general public more information on radiotherapy. And then one thing that um, uh, is really lovely is um, it's a little video on YouTube, uh, one of a kind to guide to radiation therapy. And it's a little cartoon. It's actually about radiotherapy for children and was created by Aardman Animation. So the same, same people who brought us Wallace and Gromit. Um, but it's a lovely little animation and um, like it's very, it's very technically correct in how it describes radiotherapy. So um, 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 I, I like that as um, you know, an introduction to radiotherapy as well. The IAEA. Um, has lots of information on radiotherapy and um, where I got that, that sample design of a bumper came from the IAEA. But they're actually really interesting to follow on social media. Um, they don't just cover radiotherapy, they cover, they cover um, um, ionizing, radi uh, ionizing radiation in general. So they talk a lot about nuclear 
um, um, you know, nuclear fuels and things like that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very interesting on social media and, you know, they can have everything from, um, you know, nuclear safety in third world, third world countries to, um, you know, radiotherapy um, of animals. And um, what I really like is they always mark, um, you know, the birthdays and anniversaries of people like Marie Curie who had, um, uh, you know, are, are the reason why we have so much information. We have this um, treatment technique available today. In terms of dose measurement and calibration, it's the NPL labs. Um, the vendors, the two main vendors of radiotherapy, uh, radiotherapy accelerators, um, Electa and Varian. Um, and Varian, actually, there used to be three. Siemens used to be involved as well. They went out of the market, but now they have joined up with Varian again um, and, um, in, tr in terms of um, merging in the radiotherapy um, area. Um, and then the last little bit of information that I have for you to look at is EPA, uh, who, are, who, like I said, are involved in radiation protection for the general public and staff, and then HICWA, who are involved in radi radiation protection for um, um, uh, patients. The NCRI is the National Cancer Registry, and they have all the information on cancer, on cancer cases in Ireland, and they produce really gorgeous um, maps, essentially, of, you know, incidents, incidents of cancer in Ireland and real, any facts, you know, if you really want facts um, about cancer in Ireland, that is the place to go. So um, I, I no longer work in radiotherapy, as it happens. Um, I'm now a lecturer in LIT, and um, so I just wanted to talk briefly because um, uh, in, um, Mike was saying that, that the biomedical engineering group within Engineers Ireland are um, uh, also um, invited to this talk tonight. And um, so the course I lecture on are Level 7 and Level 8 Medical and Clinical Technology courses. And the um, second, fourth years um, are going to be graduating soon. So it's quite a relatively new course. And um, so I suppose I just want to put the word out there to make people aware of that course and especially for anyone who's working in a medical device um, company um, who may be in a position to take place in students. We have a great group of um, 19 uh, th uh, third year students um, uh, who are available for placement. So if anyone works in a company um, who takes uh, within the medical device industry, who take place in students, um, uh, it might contact me. And also something that I'm developing at the moment is um, a, a master's and a postgraduate diploma in advanced medical technologies. And I was delighted to receive um, human, um, uh, human initiative capital uh, funding for that. And um, so the idea behind this 11.9 program is going to be fully flexible all online. And um, uh, essentially it's for you know, scientists and engineers who um, you know, want to move into the biomedical engineering um, space in terms of employment. And there's an, an indicative sim and that's in, 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 in progress at the moment. So I suppose if anyone has an interest um, um, in doing that, or even if a company has an interest in being involved in um, the syllabus on it and what they'd like to see from graduates, um, you know, please contact me on that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maureen. Um, can everybody hear me? Hopefully, I see nods. Um, so, good. Very good. So we have, have some uh, questions, Maureen. That, yeah. uh, that was excellent. Uh, we have a number of questions. Um, I'll just take them in the order that they came in. Um, and the first one, if I can bring it up here. Uh, the first one was from uh, John Coleman. Um, is the equipment used to deliver radiotherapy expensive to purchase and operate? I have an inkling <laughs> on, on this one myself. <laughs> And what's the lifetime of a machine and how reliable are they over their lifetime? Yeah, like two very, very interesting and pertinent questions there. Yeah, like hugely expensive, you know, millions. Um, so, um, you know, and in terms of life cycle, what's very interesting is that um, the life cycle really is about 10 years in a machine. But, um, you know, the cost of them makes that, um, you know, you have, you have clinical radiotherapy machines that are a lot older than that. Um, so what happens really, like any capital expenditure, and especially in, in terms of hospitals um, and, and in terms of medicine, the, the change is never linear. It's never, you know, a, a linear update um, of technology. It kind of happens in leaps. And, um, you know, that's what would have been seen um, in Cork with their operating machinery. And in Galway, they, um, they are currently at a, at a, at a very, a, an early stage of um, getting new machines there. And when I was talking to Brendan McLean yesterday, 
um, you know, he was talking about what I would consider the new centres of um, St. James's in Beaumont. They're about 10 years old. Um, you know, in my mind, they're, they're, they're new centres, but he was saying they actually are at the stage where they need um, new, new machines. And the, um, you know, the, the, the money isn't there, the funding isn't there for that to happen. So, you know, I suppose the reliability of the machines, um, yes, as they get older, there can be more, more problems with them. But um, that doesn't mean that a brand new machine doesn't have problems. And I suppose what we're seeing now is that the newer machines have, um, you know, better kind of remote diagnosis of what the issues are. So they'd have, um, you know, like I was saying, it, it, it's software, it's electronics. It's nothing to do with how the machine produces the radiation. It's the software and electronics that are um, improving. So with newer machines, you'd have more remote diagnosis, or yeah, diagnosis, I suppose, of the um, what's wrong with the machine. Because what can happen, obviously, in a busy radiotherapy centre, um, you know, the radiotherapy centre in Limerick, you can have, you know, 80, 90 patients being treated a day. So obviously, if one of those machines is down, um, that will cause a big, you know, delay, delay in patients. And patients need to receive their radiotherapy treatment every day. Um, so, so that can cause huge, um, huge problems, really. Um, but yeah, so, so it's funding is, is, is a huge problem in that. Um, what's interesting from the vendor perspective is that um, they are, you know, a lot of kind of emphasis is on machines now that where it used, to, it, it would have taken kind of up to six months to put in a machine to calibrate it and um, to get, you know, commissioning data because you know, there's a huge amount of physics data that you need to measure and put into the planning system. But newer machines now, they're kind of shortening that process. So there's kind of like a rapid build and a, and a rapid introduction of the, of, the, of the machine. So that when you buy a machine, you also buy the data with it and that, that, and that, can, that can be put in. Which is really interesting because just before I left radiotherapy, I went um, to um, a hospital in London looking at one of Varian's new machines. And um, what's really interesting about that is um, uh, uh, this new machine, the Halcyon, no matter where it is in the world, the machines all have the same commissioning data. So essentially, if you were having a treatment, let's say if I had having treatment in Limerick and I went on holidays to London, I could have my treatment over there for the day. Theoretically, I could have my, 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 um, my treatment there because um, you know, the, the same um, 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 data has been used. Um, so yeah, funding, fund, it's, it's funding really is, is the biggest problem, whether it's for private hospitals or public hospitals. It is an enormous capital expenditure. Okay, um, we have another question um, from um, David Purcell and, and a similar one from myself. Um, it's to do with verification, I suppose, really. How do you verify that the equipment is performing to specification? Or are there any independent audits on, on machine output? Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting question because, um, you know, there are um, protocols that are followed. And the most important thing is that your, your measurement equipment is traceable back to a primary standard. So there actually is a primary standard for dose measurement. And um, uh, the one that we would have used, um, well, that most people in Ireland use is the MPL lab in London. And that would be a primary standard for radiotherapy. So it's actually a linear accelerator. They upgraded there, I think, two years ago to an electron machine. And that linear accelerator irradiates um, you know, a, a tank of water and it's um, a calorimetry is used as the primary standard. So it, it measures a heat difference and that machine then is calibrated. So if individual centers then send their equipment, their secondary standard, which would be um, an ionizing chamber and an electrometer, and that is sent over to London to be calibrated. And what comes back is a calibration certificate for that, um, um, for those measurement devices. And those devices then are, um, those devices then are used to calibrate field chambers that are used um, 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 every day. So that traceability to the primary standard is you know, paramount really of, of the um, device that's used. And that's part of what would be audited um, by the EPA, that traceability and that the procedures and protocols are in place to trace back. But in terms of independent audit, um, there are, um, um, oh, in my head, I'm thinking John Hopkins Hospital, but actually isn't John, John Hopkins, John Hopkins. Um, it might go to be. There's a centre in the States that um, perform this independent verification where they send um, a, a kind of a block, really, essentially, that has inside it um, um, these kind of dosimeters. They're basically, when you radiate them, they almost like they store the radiation and then in certain, um, in an environment, they can be, they can be measured. And um, 
they send the block over to or, you know the, the phantom um, over to you and what happens is that phantom goes through the process of CT planning um, and the treatment and it, it's sent back and they can verify then compare to your plan whether this this block the surrogate for the patient got the same plan and um, that is something that the EPA requires um, uh, radiation ther radi radiotherapy centers in order to do. Uh, one quick question there from Pat Hanley. Um, do all Irish linear accelerators have MLC? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, MLC is considered kind of, you know, um, it, it, I, oh, I don't think you can get, get, get um, a uh, LINAC without one now. So what, where it goes after MLC then is in terms of whether the, the MLCs are static or dynamic. So dynamic is as, as the beam is on, they move. And then you have um, treatment that has fixed gantry angles. So the machine is, is going around the patient and it stops at, at specific angles and delivers the dose. And then you have VMAT, which is volume modulated um, um, uh, therapy. And that is when the machine is moving and while it's moving, the dose is, the dose is coming out. And that is becoming now the standard. And more, I won't say all, but most centers in Ireland now would definitely be moving towards um, VMAT. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, we're trying for one or two more. We have quite a few coming in, but um, <laughs> there's one here from Suzanne uh, O'Rourke. And thanks, Suzanne, for promoting this within the Biomedical um, Division of Engineers Ireland. Um, fascinating presentation, Moraid. You mentioned the increased sophistication of the systems, including combination of mechanical, electrical software, and so on. From a technical and practitioner perspective, do you feel it's sufficient do you feel sufficient usability engineering is performed by the manufacturers to risk to assess risk? Uh, of use error with complexity of using the technology. When you assess adverse events, is the usability or use difficulty something that you see as a common contributor to those events? That's like another excellent question and a fascinating question. Like in terms of usability engineering, you know, like radiotherapy, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, used around the world, but in terms of like a user group, for the want of a better word, it would be quite, quite small. And, um, a lot, you know, as an electronic engineer myself, I found some things extraordinary in terms of usability with, um, with, with Linux. And in particular, and electronic engineers <laughs> might get a shock when they hear this, but when you're just in the output of, um, of a linear accelerator, you are actually using a screwdriver and you're adjusting your pot. Like that, that is how it's done. And um, the new versions have that um, um, all, all, all digital. But I suppose as an electrical engineer, I just thought that was incredible you know how could that be and if you open up the back of a linear accelerator you'll see these huge panels of pcbs with dual and line packages in them that you know usually have been around and you know i think anyone who works in the biomedical industry will know that the, that the reason for that and the biggest um obstacle there is um i suppose what what, what protects us also is an obstacle in terms of um um FDA regulation and, and regulation in medical device industry and implementing change is really hard. And I worked in um, Medtronic in Galway where they make ventilators. And, um, you know, I found from working there, um, you know, it, it is the biggest, you know, stumbling block in terms of, you know, usability of equipment. Because in order to implement a change, it had to go through a whole load of uh, regulatory processes that are very expensive. And it um, uh, means really that there are iterations of the final product that could, could and should maybe be more modernized or better, but there isn't really the scope to do that from the manufacturing side. So yeah, there's, there's, there's lots in, 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 in terms of Linux um, that could and should be improved, but it definitely is improving. And I think, um, I think what's happening really in the new iterations, it is that kind of user interface in terms of you know, the therapist treating the patient as well as uh, uh, physics users and one thing I actually didn't mention who are really important as well are the service engineers from the company and I would have worked very closely with the service engineers from Varian and they come and they do preventative maintenance on the machine um, yeah, quarterly usually and um, you know usability for them and you know you know you know getting information out for them um, is, is also an important part of it but um, yeah I, I think there's a long way that it can go but I'm sure um, anyone who works in, in, in medical devices can understand the struggles there. Okay, time for one or two more. Um, there's one here from Don McMorrow. Um, you noted the involvement of electrical, mechanical and civil engineering in the construction of the linear accelerators and the bunkers that house them. Can you comment on the role of software engineering to radiotherapy? 
Yeah, so um, I suppose in terms of, um, you know, treatment planning, software engineering is, is, is a huge part of that. And also within radiotherapy um, is um, record and verify systems. So, you know, there's this whole move to, you know, paperless um, uh, treat, treatment centres and the new centres in Ireland would be completely paperless. When I worked in Galway, it was paper light. Um, you know, there was, very, there, was, there was very little paperwork. Um, and, you know, software engineers have a huge role to play in terms of the record and verify systems where the, where the patient information is all, you know, is all digitised, everything from their, um, you know, diagnosis and treatment and previous information to their current treatment plan and then recording the as it is as it, as it is going and um you know software engineering you know has a huge role to play um interestingly varian have um you know in terms of um software um, and you know varian is what i'm most familiar with because as a manufacturer because they're the machines that i worked with for longest but they have introduced um so kind of the the record and verify system that they have in radiotherapy they now are kind of broadening that in oncology to chemotherapy as well where the same system will be used in order to recur, record chemotherapy doses um, and, um, and you know, the information um, associated, um, associated with chemotherapy. So, um, yeah, there's lots of areas really where software engineering, and as I think I, I, think I mentioned very briefly, in terms of um, interrogation of the machine when it is in clinical practice, um, you know, if there's, if there's a problem with the machine, that it can be diagnosed remotely. Um, you know, and um, you know, obviously there is the um, um, requirements around, I suppose, prevention of hacking. That you know, someone can't just hack into a linear accelerator, and also GDPR patient information. So there's all those kind of issues that come into play as well. Very good. We have time for one or two more. Um, a question from Pat Hanley again is: uh, Are unintended overdoses usually due to equipment issues or human error? Oh, um, that's kind. Of, that's a that's a hard one really to um, to answer because um, the way radiotherapy works, works is that um, unintended exposures are are, are generally caught. You know that's that Swiss cheese um, kind of approach. Unintended exposures are, are usually caught early. It can be a mixture of of both. Um, for example, so let's say if someone's having a dose of radiotherapy, and if um, you know, for some reason. Um, you know, there's unintended dose of one fraction that can kind of be compensated further down the line so that the overall dose doesn't exceed. But where you do see um, um, uh, unintended exposure is to do with the imaging. So, for example, if um, a, a setup image is taken um, and, and for some reason that is not usable, you know, due to, let's say, you know, the, the equipment, you know, software going offline or, or something like that, then that's actually a, a reportable radiation incident because it means that a patient has. Um, um, and has, has an image that isn't usable. Um, so yeah, so to delve into that question is really kind of complicated. Um, you know, like it, it, it's all about following international best practices and also, also about having, um, um, you know, um, a kind of um, like the work that HICRA do in terms of reporting and, and, and recording it. It's very important and that, you know, you, you know every mistake is, is learned. And internationally, um, there, you know, is excellent reporting of radiation incidents and, you know, great papers and, you know, best practice come, you know, come out of that as well. Okay. So major incidents are really, really rare, like very, very rare. Um, and, uh, you know, all the systems are, are, are in place that they don't, that they don't. Have. Okay. Thanks for that. There's maybe time for one or two more. There's um, a question from Noreen Deneen here. A great talk. Thanks, Noreen. Can you explain the difference that a PET scan versus a CT scan might have in determining treatment? Okay, so um, a, PET, a PET scan um, uh, uh, uses a radioactive isotope and that's basically, it's picked up by a tumor and it, it basically looks like a beacon on the scan. It's like shines a light and it shows where the tumor is. So that gives kind of metabolic information, whereas a, a CT scan gives information about um, uh, bony and soft tissue anatomy, essentially. And um, so a PET scan isn't used for treatment planning um, because you, it, it basically showing the metabolic information. It doesn't show the um, uh, anatomical information for treatment planning. Um, 
Mike, you're going to have to hit me with that question again of what exactly the question is. Yeah, I suppose, was. yeah. Does it make a difference? The, the, the PET scan versus a CT scan, does it make a difference in determining the treatment and what, what you can see on those, I suppose? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so like in terms of diagnosis, the, the PET CT would be, would be what gives you the information and it would, it would exactly locate where the tumour is. And often in treatment planning, um, you can uh, overlay images on each other and use the planning CT as well as the PET CT in order to... Um, you know, delineate correctly the, the, the target, essentially. So they're used. Um, okay. They're used together. Second last question is a quick one from Jonathan Kidd there. Are there any special electrical supply requirements for these machines? Do they need their own power station? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, pretty much. Yeah, there are. Um, God, I couldn't give you, I couldn't give you details, um, you know, in, in terms of numbers, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is, there is dedicated supply and there'll be dedicated um, circuit breakers in the plant really um, in the, um, in the radiotherapy department that would um, ensure the, ensure the supply. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't give, I can't give numbers now off the top of my head. I should have been prepared for that question now with, with, with the audience. But um, yeah, there is, there is dedicated, um, dedicated supply and plant and definitely internally that you'd have, um, they're very high energy or high electrical energy requirements of the machine. And on, a, on an uninterruptible supply, I imagine, for the hospital, yeah. you could have the power cutting out in the middle of a, of a treatment. Yeah. Um, the last one for me is, um, how do you become a medical physicist? Um, well, that's, yeah, so in Ireland, there's a master's um, in Galway, um, a medical physics um, master's. Um, but how I got into medical physics was, was slightly different. As I mentioned earlier, there's the National Programme for Radiation Oncology. And in that program, they um, um, identified the need for medical physicists and they pushed for this program. And what's amazing, really, is they use an American model, um, a CAMPEP, uh, CAMPEP is the organization. So the training program I did is accredited by CAMPEP. And um, th that model, so when I did my training, even though I was in Galway, I was very closely linked to, um, to Dublin and the St. Luke's Network in Dublin. Um, so that is essentially, essentially how you become um, a medical physicist would be either doing a master's, medical physicist, which, of which there's one in Galway, or else doing a training program. And that, you know, that comes up um, at different times. Um, you know, there's a small community of medical physicists in, in Ireland. We have um, exported some great medical physicists to the UK, you know, in terms of their, their, their not being, you know, a huge amount of jobs here the whole time. But we've also got back hugely experienced medical physicists from the UK as well. Um, so there'd be, um, you know, big interaction that way. Okay. So I think I'm going to start the wrap up there. Um, I think with that, Moraid, uh, first of all, I'd like to sincerely thank you, uh, our speaker this evening, for, for delivering a most interesting lecture. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our attendees um, that, are, that, are, uh, that are with us this evening for your attention and your...